I, he read and he thought that was talking about Christians. Go back to that one more time, Phil. The one I'm talking about. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse uh, 12. I remember him telling me this, that this bothered him. Because when he saw the children of the kingdom, he thought that must mean Christians. It doesn't mean Christians. The children of the kingdom. Did, did we just read it a minute ago? Whoever comes to me, I'll never cast him out. Well, I think I can take that to the bank, don't you? You know what I mean by that? I can count on that. Now, who are the children of the kingdom? Well, if you read the context here, I think it's pretty clear he's talking about those in the, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament believers of God, the Old Covenant people of God. Well, does he ever refer to them as, as children of the kingdom anywhere else? I mean, is that language he uses? Oh, yes, it is. Let me just show you one here. It's, uh, if you'll give me um, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. I quoted this a minute ago, but let's read it. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. And Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, the woman of Canaan, by the way, uh, one of these Gentiles we were talking about, that saw a great light. He, uh, she's evidently seen that great light too. And a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. And he answered her, Not a word. Ooh, that's not very nice, is it? Is it? <laughs> not very polite. He answered her, Not a word. And his disciple, I, I got to turn around and make sure I read it right. See, <laughs> I'm reading my Bible here. He answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered them and said, Listen, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Do you think he's telling us the truth here? In his earthly ministry, this is true. He said, I'm not sent to Gentiles. I'm not sent to deal with her. And here's a, an interesting thing. Verse 25, then she came and worshipped him. Wow. She evidently was one of those Gentiles that saw a great light. She came and worshipped him. It sounds like she has a certain amount of a confidence and faith in him, does it not? She came and worshipped him. See, she is not a person who's standing off indifferent, following him around, thinking, oh, this is interesting, let's see what's going to happen. Oh, I don't know, I thought I... You know, like, like the people that in Israel who followed him didn't really believe him. She worshipped him. You notice that? Yeah, that's pretty strong. Verse 26. And he answered and said, still though, he's, he, he says, listen to what he says, it is not meat, that word means appropriate. It is not appropriate to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Okay, who's the children, who's the dogs? She's the dog. She's the Gentile. She's the outsider. He said, it's not appropriate for me to take what belongs to the children. Who's the children? He says, I'm not sent to anyone except the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He means at that time at that moment. They're the children. What's the bread? All the good things he has, all the blessings, all the healing, the, all the things he was distributing. He called that the children's bread. It belongs to, who are the children? That's what I'm getting at. Because when he says the children of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness, he means those unbelieving Israelites are going to be on the outside. And he, see, I, I, this is a disturbing verse to some people who say, well, you know, Jesus here, he's re using reverse psychology. <laughs> no, he's not using reverse psychology. He's just telling the way it was. That is, at that time, the way it was. She didn't have any right to, to, to God. She's outside the covenant. Right? Yes. She's an outsider. They're the insiders. He says, at this moment, I'm dealing with the insiders. And they're the children. The reason I'm emphasizing this is that's what he meant back in chapter 8 when he said the children will be cast into outer the, Not us, not Christians. He said, I'll never cast away anyone who comes to me. Guess what? You know, they didn't come to him. Did you know there's places where he says to the Pharisees, he says, you trust in Moses and you trust in the law, but Moses spoke of me and you won't come to me so you can have everlasting life. What's the issue? To come to him, right? Okay, so let's finish this little story. It is not appropriate to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And then she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. You know what that means? What they reject, I'll take. <laughs> There, she had some real insight here. She said, she knew they're not receiving you. They're rejecting you. But look at me, I'm receiving you. Yeah. The crumbs that fall from their table, uh, the dogs can eat it. In other words, what they don't want, I, you know, they, don't, they don't believe in you the way I believe in you. I'll take what they don't want. Verse 28. Jesus answered and he said, O oh woman, great is thy... It, it seems to me like the thing that he commends more than anything else is to believe in him, his faith. Didn't we read that when he said, this is the will of God? For him personally, the will of God was that I don't lose any that come to me. 
For us, he says, the will of God is that we see him and believe in him. Am I right about that? Okay. Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Did you know this is the same thing he said to the centurion? I didn't finish reading that. He said, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto you. Wow, that's pretty strong. And the woman's daughter was made whole from that very hour. She got Jesus to move out of the time frame that he was in. It wasn't her turn yet, but because of her faith, and same thing with the centurion, because what the people he was come to minister to, he came as a minister. You know, Paul says it this way, that Jesus, let's just read it. Uh, Phil, give me uh, Romans chapter 15. And I'll just read this to you, and this will uh, help clarify it a little bit. Uh, Romans chapter 15, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I just can't quote this off the top of my head. Uh, verse 8. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Circumcision referring to symbolic of the Old Testament. It was required under the law. Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. You know, that's what he was doing during his earthly ministry. He was fulfilling and confirming every promise made under the Old Covenant. See, before he could make a new covenant, he had to fulfill and confirm and wrap up all the promises made. Did you know all the promises made under the old covenant are all fulfilled and focused on Christ? He is the fulfillment of everything God ever promised. Yeah. And he wrapped up and confirmed and fulfilled all of those things. Now, uh, just so we don't end on a, on, on a down note, and there's uh, a couple of more I was going to read, but I just want to quickly, I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm going to go on a little tour of... Uh, of the scriptures in the, uh, in the New Testament where he says, you see what I've, what I've suggested to you before is the one critical thing is that we believe on him. That that is what he wants. What is it then that God wants out of us? You see, this is where the, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. This is where the critical factor is. What is it that God expects us to do uh, uh, in order to, uh, to do what he wants us to do? Well, uh, okay, Phil, are you ready? I'm going to make Phil work now. First one, Phil, John chapter 3, verse 14. John 3, 14. I'm just going to read fast. I'm, not going to, I'm going to try not to comment. But I want you to notice, here's what I want you to notice. How often the word believe comes up as in, in reference to what we're expected to do. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever does what? Yeah. Right. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God loved the world, so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever does what? Believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Aren't you glad about that? But that the world through him might be saved. One more verse. He the what? Believeth. How many times in this little passage? I think I count three so far. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Now, are you a believer on him? Well, Jesus says you're not condemned. So you don't have anything to worry about, about the, those... See, when we read those disturbing verses that some people get upset about, evidently, he's not talking about believers. Because Jesus said, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Now, does that mean that... Uh, see, notice he doesn't say, whoever believes in him, and boy, you better be straight and not ever make any more mistakes. <laughs> That's what some people think. Because, and it's not good, we don't want to make mistakes, but let's be honest, as long as you're in a body of flesh, you're prone. You, you've got the capacity to make mistakes. Well, what's going to happen if I make a mistake, big or little? Is he going to throw me out? No, he says, whoever comes to me, I'll never cast him out. Because he's already done something about your mistakes. On the cross, he carried our sins in his own body on the tree. So what are we supposed to do in the light of that? Believe in him. Put our trust in him, not in ourselves. Okay, Phil, one more. Uh, well, not one more, a couple more. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 24. I'm going to go quick here. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you... Oh, wait a minute. You know what? Back there in John's Gospel, in chapter 3, I talked to a man one time... I, I wish you could follow around with me sometime during the week and see what I have to put up with. <laughs> you know, I can't even get gas at, at Ampride without somebody grabbing me and wanting to talk about theology. I, I don't, I'm just getting gas. I don't, you know, if you want to come to church, we'll talk at church, but I want to get gas right now. You know, I, I want to say what I'm tempted to say, leave me alone. Let me get my gas, you know. I had a guy, and he... he <laughs> He wanted, you know what, the, what is, John, uh, uh, Don, what is the convenience store out by your into town? Is it called Light and Night or? Light and Night. Yeah, Light and Night, yes. Light and yeah. This man called me and said, I want you to meet me at the Light and Night. Very significant, this is important. And he was disturbed. He had his Bible there and we were drinking Coke. And he's, you know, uh, he was trying to say to me that Paul, it's all his fault. Paul has corrupted the message of Jesus. And, and Paul.